So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about how the Bible is like this puzzle box right here. And if you're not familiar with this puzzle box, I'll tell you what this is. Uh, this is from a, a movie from my childhood here called Hellraiser. And this box here was supposed to be this mystical item that was like a, a key to open a doorway where it would either open up heaven and paradise for you or it would open up hell and people would really want to open up heaven and the, the pleasures of paradise so they would risk it and go to this puzzle box and it ends up turning different shapes and eventually it opens up a door that you can't see and generally, the people open it up, and it opens up to hell. That's why the movie's called Hellraiser. And these demon-like creatures who have been deformed through torture would end up torturing in very grotesque ways the people that open this, this box up and then claim that they're showing them pleasures in such wonderful sights and what have you. And sometimes they would actually take these people and turn them into one of them. So through the torture, their body's been deformed and they turn into one of these things that they call a symbiont who would then do the same thing. Anybody who opened it up and opened it up to hell, it, they would torture them. And you may be saying, how is this anything like the Bible? Well, in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe it starts at verse 12, we are told that the Bible, that the scriptures are alive and that they judge us. It judges our intents, our intentions. So this is why you get all these different divisions of people who read the Bible. Because it ends up revealing their heart. So you have one person read the Bible. And they start judging God. Judging him as immoral. And none of this is right. And they put themselves in a group of atheists. Because they don't like how God is depicted. They think. God is immoral. So in other words, because they don't like him and that he judges them and condemns them when they think he should be condemned, that they just decide he doesn't even exist then. They don't like him. So they're not going to believe in him. So they put themselves into the group of atheists. And you can look at these as different, these different groups as different gardens. Because they're each one planted with an idea. So the atheist reads it and they look at it as myths and fairy tales and whatever they say, nonsense or whatever. And it reveals what's in their heart that they don't believe, right? Then you'll have another group that reads and they'll say, this can't be understood, right? 
and you need to have a special education. You need to know the original Hebrew and the original Greek. And you need to know the traditions of the church, and uh, you need these this group of people to tell you what it means. And they end up filing themselves into a group of Roman Catholicism or Orthodox, and they'll sit there and they won't really even get into the Bible and really do what the Bible says and to study it, to show yourself approved unto God. They're like, no, no, I, I'm just a lay person. I can't know it and understand it. And not believing it when it says that God will give you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide you. And they will mock such a thing saying, yeah, everybody says, you know, the Holy Spirit's guiding them. And look at all these different groups. It was like, yeah, because they're, each group is revealing their heart, isn't it? So that group goes off from there. And then you'll have another group that will read it. And they will say, oh, this can't be right. And they start changing it. Where they're like, oh, this is what it really means. And they'll mess around with that where... They'll do it in different ways, such as, oh, they'll start with something like the King James Version. And at a certain passage, it, it doesn't say what they want it to say, so they'll go to the NIV. And then when the NIV isn't really saying what it, they want it to say, well, now we'll go to the ESV. And when the ESV is not saying what we want, let's use the Revised Standard. And we'll use all these different versions and we will make a Frankenstein version of what we think the Bible ought to say. And that's one way, and that seems to be the most common way today. And that's why you got uh, the churches saying, oh, you basically preach and use whatever version you want, when that causes confusion, because they're not all actually saying the same thing. Right? So it's just... You make up what the Word of God is, so you end up putting into this group which makes up most of Protestantism, where they're all just making it up themselves. So they put themselves into this garden of just confusion. And then the other groups, what they'll do is they'll completely just change it, such as uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and the Seventh-day Adventists. Where the Jehovah's Witnesses just literally took a pen or a marker there and just wiped out the parts of the Bible that they say were, were incorrect. How do they know it's incorrect? Because they didn't like what I said. It, it didn't agree with their belief, so they just wiped it out. And then they made their own Watchtower Bible. And then you have um, the Mormons who were like, oh yeah, well it's not finished. They get a special revelation from some angel, I think named Maroni or something like that. And this Jehovah's Witness fella, uh, Joseph Smith, not Jehovah's Witness, I don't know I said that, I meant to say Mormon fella, uh, Joseph Smith, looks into a hat where there's golden plates that nobody else gets to see. And he's able to read a language on them that nobody else is able to read while he sticks his head into this, this hat. And he translates these golden tablets that he was given that nobody saw. And it's a language that nobody else can read. But he's going to tell everybody what it says. And he has somebody write uh, the Book of Mormon. And if that doesn't sound like nonsense to you, uh, you're probably indoctrinated and grew up Mormon. Because that's the only way you're going to believe such an idea. There's such a thing there. And not see it as foolishness. So they, what they do is they add to the Word of God, such as the Book of Mormon. The Seventh-day Adventists do the same thing, even though they'll say, oh, we're Sola Scriptura, as in the Bible alone. And they'll, some of them even will say that they're King James only. But then when you read the Bible and you don't come to the same conclusion as their prophet Ellen G. White, who is basically their pope, and what she has said through her writings, well then you're wrong. 
right? So they basically put Ellen G. White, as they say she's a prophet, that means her writings are inspired, they're equal to the Word of God. So they add to it as well, except they try to subtly hide it by saying, oh yeah, Bible alone, Sola Scriptura, but they're leaving out the fact that they are believing, even though they're not straight up stating it, stating it that Ellen G. White's writings are also scripture. And they might say, oh, that's not true, but then they'll treat them on par as the scriptures. So they're, they're, they're buying into their own deception, right? They're trying to deceive you, and then they started to believe their deception. The uh, Muslims, you can say, is another group who does the same thing. Oh, the The Bible is the word of God or the word of their Allah, but it's been corrupted. So now we got this advanced revelation from Muhammad, and that's incorruptible because the word of Allah is incorruptible. And then they're like, well, you just ran into a contradiction there, right? You, you said that uh, the Bible is the word of Allah, and but the word of Allah can't be corrupted, but the Bible is corrupted. You see, it's all because these people, they read it and they don't like what it says. They don't like what it reveals about themselves because people come to the Bible. They come to God looking for what? Heaven, paradise, eternal pleasures, right? But then the Bible, what does it do? It condemns all of us to hell, right? And people don't like the fact that it looks at all of us. As an unclean thing. We're all condemned to the cross, deserving what Jesus went through, condemned to death and hell. So the people don't like that. So they gotta they change it. They don't talk to God about it. They don't accept his condemnation of them. They don't see it as just, even though we're all sinners. We're all imperfect. We've all thought, said, and done things that we regret. And there's nothing we can do to change it. And the effects that it had on us and others. Right? We all have the desire to sin too, which makes us not fit for heaven. Because we would be there desiring to do things we ought not to be doing, right? And the Bible also tells us that we are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So we don't come to the Bible coming to find God and to know God. We come to it for ourselves to do what? To avoid hell and to earn heaven. Where the law is summed up by loving God with all you got and loving your fellow man as yourself. But we come to the Bible focused on ourselves, trying to avoid hell and to earn heaven. So we mess with the box and we try to open up the puzzle, trying to get to heaven, to get to the pleasure. And since that's our intention, it reveals this to us, that we're condemned and it sends us to hell. Just like the puzzle box here. Except most people will never accept God's condemnation of us as just, even though it clearly is, because we don't love God with all we got. We don't love our fellow man as ourselves. We're completely selfish, focused on our own pleasures and our own joy and happiness and avoiding hell and suffering. Like the basis of the bottom of the tier here, atheism, that's what they look at as morality. Whatever is for the common good and well-being or the individual pleasure and the avoidance of harm and suffering, right? And that's exactly the foundation of the selfish man. And that's why we're not fit for heaven is because we, we don't think of, oh, I will suffer for somebody else. I will suffer to achieve a goal, right? We don't look at it as suffering as something that is beneficial or at times needed. 
and we don't think of it as a deserving punishment. We, we look at it as evil and wrong, right? Everything should be just fun and pleasure. We're, we're basically just seeking a drug. And the Bible reveals this about us. And not only did the people not accept this, and that's why Jesus says that the road to destruction is broad and many be on it. And the road to life is very narrow and very few be on it. Because very few people will actually come to the Bible, whether they're an atheist, a Muslim, or some other non-believer, or a Catholic, or an Orthodox fella, and actually accept the condemnation, and then also accept that there's nothing they can do to save themselves. Because an Orthodox or a Roman Catholic, they may accept that they're condemned for their sins, but they won't accept the fact that they can't save themselves. But the same thing with a Seventh Day Adventist, right? That these three groups, for example, they may accept the condemnation, but then they're like, "But I'm not going to be condemned. You all are going to get, get be condemned because I'm actually going to repent of my sins and not sin anymore, and I'm going to do all these religious rituals of going to church on the." Correct Sabbath day, and I'm gonna confess to the priest and say my Hail Marys and Our Fathers and partake of the Eucharist and do all these other rituals that I need to do and jump through these flaming hoops to make me a better man, a better woman, where I deserve heaven. But they don't see that they're still in that same boat where they're trying to open the puzzle box, selfishly trying to avoid hell and suffering, and not accepting that that's what they deserve. And trying to open it up to heaven themselves. When ultimately only Jesus himself can open it up to heaven. He's the one with the keys. He is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way out of the Father. And the people don't actually come to the point where they realize that. Yes, God condemns us. But he's also for us, not against us. He actually loves us to the point that even though we're condemned and we deserve hell, he wants to give us mercy where we don't get that. We don't get hell. He's like, you know what? I will take on your punishment for you. You know that cross that you should be hung on and sent to hell? I'm going to go to that cross for you. I'm going to suffer for you. But you have to accept that this is your condemnation. You have to lay down your entire life to me by faith, by accepting the fact that you're condemned and that there's nothing you can do to save yourself so that you lay down your righteousness and trying to establish your some kind of foundation that you're good enough. You're just trying to build a tower of Babel to get to heaven. You're being a thief and a robber by trying to establish your righteousness and you just stop trying to build that tower. You let it crumble, knowing that you can't build it to heaven. By establishing your own righteousness, laying down your past, present, and future, laying your 100% of your life there so that Jesus can take it. He can take the punishment for you because he would rather die than live without you. So that when he raises from the dead, because he he's God, he's eternal, he can't actually die and he is not a sinner. He just carried your sin into hell. And when he raises from the from the dead, that life that he has and that perfect life that he lived and put on the cross for you, since you gave him 100% of you, he gives you 100% of him so that his perfect life is now your perfect life. His righteousness is your righteousness. His eternal life is your eternal life. He He's willing to give you himself in exchange for you so that you're bonded to him so that you can't die. You will never go to hell, but it has to be through him because he is heaven. He is paradise. He is the eternal pleasure. He is love. He is everything that we want. Righteousness, justice, peace, joy, hope. He is all those things, but all the people who come to it through the Bible reject it and don't want it. Because it means you have to accept God. You have to accept Jesus Christ. 
you have to eat the humble pie to accept the fact that you don't deserve heaven and there's nothing you can do to deserve heaven. You deserve hell and there's nothing you can do to not deserve hell. Except for accept the condemnation and die. Well, you see a lot of these people, they come to the Bible and they become symbiotes. Where like a group of atheists or a group of Roman Catholics where they read the Bible and one group says, oh, yeah, uh, it says I'm condemned, but no, God's condemned. And they become this group or garden of atheists. Well, another group, see, it says, yeah, I'm condemned, but I'm going to do what's necessary to not be condemned. And they're in this garden of Roman Catholics, right? Both sit there in their own torture where over years of being in this, it changes you. Your thoughts change you from the inside out over time. As, again, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he, right? And with a group of atheists, they're going through that torture. There is no God. And they have that internal battle within themselves that they're not really going to talk about, where there is no justification for morality in atheism. It's a do as thou wilt. Uh, might is right. Right? It, it's just a, it creates what we're kind of seeing today on the left, where people just do what they want. They pretend that they are something that they really obviously are not, because there is no objective reality. They created this because they removed God. And we see what's coming of it, the fruit of the atheism. And the torture that's going on within them, where you don't go along with their delusion and these people get mad and they start attacking you. Sometimes it's just verbally, verbal attacks. But that's what they do because misery loves company. All right. And you can see that the pain that's within them, even though you, you might not be some crazy, insane suffering they're going through, they're going through suffering. Right? Because they opened up the box to hell. And then they become one of the symbiotes and they start torturing others and bringing others into that same hell. On the other side with like the Roman Catholics, they're sitting there trying to run on this treadmill. Trying to get to an end of a road. When the treadmill doesn't go anywhere, but they think, oh, I'm running here, I'm going to get somewhere. I'm going to earn the salvation, this golden carrot that's hung out before them. But they never get any closer to it. But they're going to keep on going and going. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there one day. I, I talked to this uh, Seventh-day Adventist. I know it's not a Roman Catholic, but they had the same mindset that you have to be into that basically a state of perfection, like a saint that they consider a saint, that they meet that standard where they get to go to heaven. And this guy was about 90 years old. And I guess because of the Seventh-day Adventist diet, he's very clear of mind, you know, reasonable. You could talk to him, have a conversation with him. And he was telling me that I got to stop sinning so I can, you know, go to heaven. And I, uh, I asked him, how long has he been a Christian? And he says he was a Seventh-day Adventist since he was around 12 years old. And I was like, oh, so about 80 years. I was like, that's crazy. And he's like, yep. And I was like, have you stopped sinning? And he was taken back by that. And reluctantly, he said no. And I was like, huh, I'm like half your age, less than half your age, and I haven't even been a Christian for half as long as you've been. And you're going to tell me that I need to stop sinning to go to heaven. But you've been a Christian trying to keep this law for 80 years and you still haven't done it. Do you not see some hypocrisy there? And I mean, how long does it take? And it's the same thing with the Roman Catholics. They'll, they'll be there, born a Catholic, die a Catholic. And the longer they've been on that treadmill, the more they build up this 
this stone heart where they're like, no, I've been on this treadmill. God's going to reward me. I haven't spent five years, 10 years, 20, 40 years on this treadmill not to get something for it. God's going to give me something for it. I'm not going to just get off of it and say this was a waste of time. And they become hardened in it where I'm like, no, they, they stubbornly stick on that treadmill no matter what. Thinking, no, God's going to give me something. Like they're going to demand something from God when they die. I followed the Catholic Church for 40 years, 60 years, 80, 100 years. You're going to give me something for this. I went all through this. And it's a hell. And they end up becoming a symbiote themselves where they become hardened and embittered into that. And then they start pushing that on to their, their family and friends. That they need to be doing the same thing. And then on their grandchildren. Start uh, pressuring them and intimidating them and coercing them and guilt tripping them and manipulating them to get on the treadmill and to go through the same torture. Where they too become these symbiotes, these demonic like creatures torturing other people the way they were tortured. Because other tortured souls turn them into the tortured souls that they are. And it's just like what we see in the movie. And that's why you have all these different denominations. So if a, a Roman Catholic ever brings that up, which a good chance they will if you have a conversation with them, and you're not Roman Catholic, and you start talking about something like Sola Scriptura, and you're saying, oh, if Sola, Scriptura, if Sola Scriptura is true, why are there so many different denominations? It was like, how does that disprove Sola Scriptura? All it proves is that people build their own groups and they make up what they want. How does that prove that following the Bible is wrong and following the Bible alone is wrong? Especially when you study these groups and you realize, well, a lot of them, like some of the ones I brought up, they add and remove from the Bible. Even the ones that claim to be solo scriptura, like the Seventh-day Adventists, they add to it. And by adding to it, they remove from it. Because when you start talking to the Seventh-day Adventist about Paul and his writings, a lot of them will say ah, his writing should not be in the Bible. He's a false apostle. They'll end up coming to that point where not only do they add Ellen White to the Bible, they remove Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. You even have with the Calvinists. They're not relying on Bible alone, even though that's what they'll say. They re rely on Kelvin's interpretation and on Augustine and some other people and the, the Reformers. What did the Reformers believe? Where they're just like the Catholics, where it's like, oh, it's not about what the Bible says. It's about what the early church said about it. And it's like, OK, the Calvinists are no different. You're not actually caring about what the Bible says. You care about what the Reformers had to say about it. So you're not following God, you're not following the Bible, even though that's what you say you are doing. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to others. So the reason why there's so many denominations is that the main thing is, is that people aren't really following the Bible and the Bible alone. They're either removing from it or adding to it. And it's revealing their heart. And when it reveals their heart, it ends up putting them into a group and a little garden of the people of the same mindset. And they start gathering the people of their same mindset. Just like Jesus says, when the harvest, there's going to be a separation of the wheat and the tares. All right, His group of wheat is going to be gathered together. There's going to be a gathering of tares to be burned. And they do it themselves. It's the power of the Word of God, right? The Word of God, not only in Hebrews 4, talks about it being alive. It talks about it being a sword where it divides. It divides the, the, the sinew, the muscle from the bone. It can divide the, the spirit from the soul because the soul and spirit are two different things. So it can separate these things. And we see that's what's going on with the people who read it. It divides them where there's the true believers. And then you have a bunch of the groups of unbelievers. 
and you think of it, oh, it's the church divided and or what have you. No, it's actually a bunch of unbelievers gathered together into different groups, and then there's one group of the believers. And they they may be spread out all over the place, but they are one group in the one garden, spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking. So with uh, all that being said, I think you can see the, the metaphor here, the analogy, the comparison here, and how these things are connected. That the, the Bible is very much like this puzzle box where people come looking for this, this pleasure and the, the eternal life, but they end up getting hell because it reveals their heart. And it's only the pure of heart who actually are coming to know God and accept the truth, right? Because they actually want the truth. Jesus says that he is the truth. So if you're coming for the truth, you're coming to know God because he is the truth. But the people who, who don't want the truth, they want something that boosts their ego, makes them feel good about themselves. Because it's all about self-confidence and all this other self-esteem nonsense. Well, that's what they open up. They open up their own little hell, their own little little fake world. It's a lie, right? You, you're good enough. You're not bad. God's bad or whatever it is. You make up your own delusional little world and then you try to bring other people into it and you create your own little section of hell here on earth of a bunch of tears. So with all that being said, thanks for watching. And take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12, at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible, the Scriptures, are the written Word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who were coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah, just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. 
it helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested of the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested of the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them no that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature you need to come to jesus to be born again sealed with his holy spirit and become one with his spirit and as jesus says in john 6 63 his word is spirit and it is truth flesh profits nothing you get into the word you are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, 
then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? 
you're saved or you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. 